Hello, Dr. Simon Freilich back with the Clinical Neurophysiology channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about sleep hygiene. How does it work? What are the general principles of sleep around it? Is it still relevant today? And what are current recommended approaches? So let's first deal with the big sleep question really, which is circadian rhythms are inherent throughout biology. Humans primarily function during the daytime. Um, and when it's dark, we stop moving, both in terms of accident prevention, because our eyes are just not geared up for night vision, really, and in terms of conservation of energy as well. Now, when that happens, we start to close our eyes, we fall off asleep, and our brain activities switch their emphasis more towards housekeeping, whether they are cognitive tasks or metabolic aspects of housekeeping. Now, there are a whole variety of, of animals uh, which sleep differently to us. So, for example, uh, the dolphin, when it falls asleep, it turns off half of its brain. It goes into unihemispheric sleep. We, however, we fully lose consciousness and we dampen down our awareness to external environmental uh, stimuli. And the question is, why us? Why, why do we do this? Now, in terms of fundamentals, our brain is hardwired to, number one, um, be able to be sensitive to the light cycle. So we have a light cycle clock, which I'll talk about in the next video. And also, apart from that, we have sleep debt. So if we don't sleep the relevant uh, or requisite amount of time, then actually we build up this debt, we become increasingly dysfunctional, and that debt has to be repaid back at some point. Additional to that, in terms of safety, we have to be in a relaxed state, and we have to be in a, an, an area, really, where our risk of danger is reduced. Sleep hygiene is a set of behavioral and environmental practices designed to promote better sleep. And when we're talking about better sleep, we're talking about the duration of sleep, the sleep quantity, we're talking about sleep quality, which I've talked about in another video, an iCard above as usual, um, and next day functionality. And by following the concepts of sleep hygiene, the idea is that we promote a state whereby sleep can occur and whereby we reduce any alerting factors. Now, a whole practice of sleep has vastly changed um, through human history um, in terms of our experience, our understanding how we used to sleep a couple of hundred years ago is vastly different to how we sleep now. Back then, we could sleep perhaps in, in smaller blocks. So we would go to sleep when it would get dark wake up during the middle of the night, then go back to sleep again, and then wake up with the dawn. These days, we tend to sleep in one long block. And um, there have been a variety of different changes which um, have facilitated that, whether it's on our own understanding of biology or um, in terms of technology. So, for example, Thomas Edison with a light bulb. Instead of having to rely on natural uh, sunlight, um, to do our activities. Uh, we now have the ability to have artificial light, whether it's in our homes, our workplaces, etc. And society has changed too as a result as well. We now have night shifts and all sorts of um, ways in which um, our bodies are being asked to do things of it uh, which were not the same uh, not that long ago. And our concept and practice of sleep and sleep hygiene has very much been in a, a current format really since the 1970s. So in terms of behaviours, we would always recommend to have a regular routine. What that means is, is actually quite complex as we'll see a bit later on. But um, in terms of certain things to, to try and avoid, avoiding afternoon naps is important, and also winding down before bedtime, which is increasingly difficult uh, in, in these days where there are these continually uh, blurring lines between uh, work and home, um, emails, social media, and all of that stuff. And it's important to be able to have behaviors which promote positive relaxation, which can be very unique to individuals, whether perhaps maybe listening to certain types of music, doing certain types of things, uh, reading certain types of uh, materials, etc. And bedroom activities, which are very much about bedroom behavior, not about bringing work in or, or stressful conversations and so on. Exercise is quite complex because although exercise is recommended um, during the daytime, exercising just before bedtime is 
not very good in terms of promoting sleep, having your heart pumping, adrenaline going and so on. Actually, it's very difficult for people, for example, like myself, working uh, you know, through the daytime and into the evenings to find that sweet spot where exercise can be done without it limiting um, one's ability to relax effectively. But you know, exercise is important. In terms of the environment, light and dark is critical, whether it's within the room or outside of the room and coming into the room. So things in the room uh, to think about, obviously, is the lighting. Um, so in our own home, we have quite yellowish lights upstairs and um, more brighter, bluer type of lighting um, in the downstairs. But, you know, in the rooms to try and have um, somewhat uh, dimmer, yellower lighting will be very important, making sure that there isn't light coming in from the outside. So make sure you've got uh, curtains which can uh, block out light or blinds and so on. Uh, devices within the room, um, whether they are technology leaching light into the environment um, around us or whether it's perhaps an alarm clock. These days, a lot of them have got blue lighting with them rather than red. It's important to try and get a, a, a dimmer type of color. And of course, uh, blue light, as I've just been alluding to, is actually something which is very alerting and something which can be very disruptive to our light cycles. And we'll be talking about that in the next video. Sound is very important too, can be very disturbing. It might be a simple thing like a clock uh, cranking away um, in the background or perhaps a bed partner snoring, or maybe it sounds from the outside. Temperature is something which is very individual. Some people um, prefer to have a cooler temperature, some people are, are a warmer temperature. And the thing that tends to sort of be avoided to be said, but it's important to say it, is to have a comfortable bed, mattress, pillows, bed clothes, etc. Uh, all these things help to promote a positive relationship with going to sleep. Substances are important too. Caffeine, uh, we generally recommend, is avoided in the run up to sleep. Now, that is less relevant perhaps to people having lots of caffeine uh, but for majority of people avoiding caffeine is a good thing um, particularly in the run-up to bedtime nicotine is a stimulant alcohol is actually quite a complex substance because we know that um, it can certainly help people to fall asleep a little bit quicker, but the problem is, is that the quality of that sleep is impaired apart from other factors uh, relating to um, the general uh, health impact of alcohol, um, which you know isn't great. So about 10% of the population will be taking nightcaps um, to help them get to sleep. The flip side, apart from the general health, is that actually although it may help you get to sleep, the quality of said sleep will not be as good. Food is another aspect to consider. Large heavy meals just before um, bedtime are often not conducive to falling asleep uh, and it's generally recommended to have uh, lighter uh, evening meals and some, maybe some light snacks before falling asleep, nothing too heavy. Now, one of the things that um, I personally found quite difficult when I was talking about sleep hygiene previously is if you've been following the channel for any length of time, you'll realize that I spend a lot of time looking at what the evidence base is for anything that I talk about. And one of the things that became quite clear to me and quite glaringly obvious was that sleep hygiene as a health intervention has actually largely avoided detailed scientific scrutiny. And I felt quite uncomfortable about that um, until actually I've discovered that there are people who do talk about this um, and in fact that sleep hygiene is something more to do with removing barriers to sleep really rather than necessarily something that promotes better sleep um, this is a very good um, article and, and, and review thoroughly recommend that you have a look at it but if you really consider what's going on when we fall asleep we obviously have got biological and societal uh, processes but quite often and quite often subconsciously there are psychological and emotional aspects surrounding sleep which can can go askew and if we don't address those aspects effectively even if we we remove some of the biological and societal barriers we're still left with with those things and they can be a real impediment to us being able to be in a state whereby we can positively fall asleep so the american academy of sleep medicine 
as most status guidelines, um, you'll actually see that they recommend that cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is the primary way forward for those who've got chronic insomnia in adults. Um, and in fact, that um, sleep hygiene as a single intervention um, is not something that is recommended. So they say, we suggest that clinicians not use sleep hygiene as a single component therapy for the treatment of chronic insomnia in adults. And that's something that's changed um, over the years and decades. Now, what does cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia um, mean? Well, I'm not a psychologist, but basically there are a variety of cognitive therapy strategies, which basically look to try and reshape our relationship uh, with sleep and any underlying emotional and psychological aspects which may be impairing that. And so there are various strategies that are used for that in combination with education about sleep regulation, stimulus control, um, so that's trying to develop the bed as a cue for sleep, and sleep restriction therapy, um, which I'll let you do your own research as to how that one works out. But in terms of you know, how this is delivered, there are a variety of ways in which this can be delivered, but I would recommend to you, if you've got this, to find a way of getting this done in a way that there is personal coaching, because it's something which is very unique, it needs feedback, it needs someone to look at sleep diaries and work with you. Um, and usually it's a one or two month course of intervention um, and you know if you stick with it usually you get some very good results and of course it combines aspects as well as sleep hygiene education because we don't want to have those barriers those physical barriers to sleep um, but also you know there's relaxation training and counter arousal methods as well um, and in combination these are really the the way forward now of course, there is a role for uh, medications and so on, uh, but CBTI is the, the really the, the best evidence way forward for those who've got chronic insomnia and it should really be the first avenue uh, and port of call. So in summary, um, sleep hygiene provides a very sensible checklist of things which can be barriers to falling asleep. Of course, it's relatively cheap and harmless, uh, but actually trying to find the, the positive step forwards to try and redress that balance in terms of our usually subconscious uh, psychological and emotional elements that feed into uh, chronic insomnia, best off with dedicated CBTI programs. Happy to take any questions, but looking forward in the next video um, to be talking more about um, our light cycle and melatonin and so on. Really fascinating uh, subject. Please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing and looking forward to seeing you in the next one. All the very best.